everybody. It is every Monday, 3.30 Central. I am Ferris, your handsome host, and this has been the less handsome host. Mm, I'm the smart one, you know, but hey, it goes, we, we well, gotta have, we've got the that. dynamic duo, all right? Absolutely. Uh, all right, so Money Mondays, 3.30-ish every week. We're talking about everything, multifamily, real estate, being an entrepreneur, starting businesses, tech, whatever we really want to talk about, right? You what know, are we talking about today, to, Ben? We're trying to add some value. So today, we're building your business plan in multifamily real estate. Now, when we talk about this, this is the business plan that you have once you've, you're chasing after a deal and or you have a deal under contract, right? So let's put this you know, in perspective here. So this is kind of what we're gonna kind of go through. We've got a lot to cover. So we're gonna get right into this thing. Absolutely. All right. So what are the basics? What's the template? What's the checklist? I mean, basically, you know, so what we're talking about, right, we're not talking about the, like Ben said, we're not talking about your syndication yes, business, that's not the property business plan. And how do you put together one that you can ultimately deliver on, right? right. And it, it makes sense, right? You're gonna hit whatever returns you're looking for, whether you're looking for a 6% return annualized or a 50% return annualized, right? And so really, you know, there's, there's kind of a couple of parts of what that business plan, for us, typically it starts with just going through who the who the, the leadership is, yep. right? You know what their track record is. What do they bring to the table? What do they bring to the table? What are the different parts, right? Especially on some of these bigger deals, they're complex. Yeah. Right? People do different parts of the the, the, the the plan. Someone might be driving construction. Someone else driving asset management, etc. Mm-hmm. Right? Then you kind of from that we t- we typically start off with leadership, big overview. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of dive into the rest, right? Yes, correct. So we like correct. to give investors up front, hey, here's the plan. And, you know, what does an overview look like? It's really, you know, what are you planning to do with the deal? Why you like the deal? And me as an investor, what can I expect? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, we, we get right to the point, even in our emails, right? You know, these are the five to ten things why we like the deal, right? You know, and that's really the basis of anybody's, you know, plan is, you know what I mean? What are the, the sexy, cool, fun, profitable pieces that, that make this deal unique in comparison to others, right? So you need to, you know, but ahead of that, right, you need to determine the team. You need to determine, you know, obviously the strategy involved, right? Is it going to be a heavy value add play or is it kind of more, you know, maybe a management play, you know, like, like people like to say. And the difference between the two, right, Moore's you know, on the CapEx rehab side, more you know, on the management side, it's, hey, we're going to have another management company come in, right? Now, people could say, you know, is that a little loose? It is, right? Because who's to say that the management company coming in is going to be any better than the management company going out? But in reality, there is some stuff that might be able to be tightened up with another set of eyes on it, right? So that's kind of investment strategy. But I think you're also you're also highlighting the location in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, right? You know, I think this this latest deal that we have, Cheval, one of the things that attracted us to it was the fact that it's just a sexy Asset location. condition and location. Yeah, I mean, like, it's just an awesome centrally located uh, spot of Houston. And now when people are starting off, they're going to say, well, you know, I can't find those deals or I can't find this deal and I'm just trying to find a deal. Right? I get it, right? But at the end of the day, real estate really is about location, 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 right? Doesn't mean it has to be on the, you know, sexiest, most, you know, trafficked, you know, uh, street in the whole entire city, I but you need to have some growth going in. I on only buy around. properties on Sports Illustrated's most sexy <laughs> location, so uh, I don't know about you, Ben. No, but I mean, like, we started off, right? We had some that are in... I yeah, and it's not, you know, location, location, tra- location, tra- location called- makes everything easier. Yes. There's not a right or wrong, yes. per se, but you got to understand risk adjusted. I always harp on that, yeah. right? I will buy in a worse location, but I know it's going to be more of a headache, yep. more marketing, more of everything, right? And therefore, more my turnover. returns need to make sense. Yeah. So. so yeah, your returns need to go up with, with, with perceived risk or maybe even real risk, right? You need to be up here versus, you know, more yield play or something that's a little bit easier or something that's in a little bit better of a market. You could probably take on a little bit less, you know, return because you're going to have a lot less risk. Right, so you're gonna also highlight the location, right? Property financing is a big piece, right? You know, people are always like, what kind of debt are you putting on it? Is it Fannie, is it Freddie, is it bridge debt? You know, bridge for a lot of, you know, for a long time was kind of, you know, um, I would say probably shot, you know, shunned, but it's a tool like anything else, right? And it depends on that business plan. Mm-hmm. If you're gonna come in with a heavy rehab, Fannie and Freddie aren't gonna, they're not gonna do those types of deals. They want stuff that's a little bit more stabilized, 90% and above occupancy. They're not gonna want a bunch of down units and some other stuff. So you gotta realize that if you're gonna chase those deals that you're gonna have to go with bridge debt. And right now bridge debt, at least in terms of interest rates, is probably just as cheap 
is Fannie and Freddie. So that's why it's become now it's the, the cool thing to do and, and it's kind of back in style. Now who knows, maybe in two or three years that might change, but for right now, it's bridge. So you're gonna have to highlight those those financing you know, um, options or to the term sheet that you got from the lenders. Oh, absolutely, right. right. And for continue, Monday Mondays is every Monday, 3.30 Central. Yep. If you have comments, questions, leave it here. We'll answer them live. And you know, and if you have ideas for future topics, let us know as well, right? Otherwise, we can keep going with topics and whatever we want to do. So, back to the the business plan, right? The other thing is, you know, we kind of it's about part of it is is putting together the story, right? Ultimately, any deal we do is a story. Yeah. Every one of them is very different, right? They are. I mean, yeah. really, if you think about, it, I don't think we have any two stories that are the same. Really, if I kind of look back on all the deals that we've done historically, right? You're putting together a story that makes mm-hmm. sense, right? to sell the investor on it, right? Yep. Now, ultimately, don't put together a, a fictional story, right? That's not yeah, gonna, yeah, no, the reality. Yeah. You're putting together the realities of, hey, here's why I like this deal. Mm-hmm. Here's what I plan to do. Here's why you're protected. Here's why the market supports what we're trying to do. Here's what we plan to do on the exit. And here's why that makes sense, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera, right? It's all a story to thread the needle and you know put together a package that's gonna be attractive to investors. And, and so ultimately, you're thinking through that, right? And you're looking at it from the eyes of the operator, the eyes of the investor, the eyes of the tenant too, right? You know, does it make sense if I'm a tenant who's, you know, if my area's median income is fifteen thousand dollars, does it make sense to try to go slap a two bedroom for fifteen hundred dollars? Probably yeah. not, right? Are they so, going to care about granite countertops yeah. and stainless steel provinces? Probably not. They just want safe, quality, clean housing. So you, you know, that's actually a good point, right? You've got to make sure that your business plan. If you just step back and look at it, does it make sense, right? You know, because there's some people that do stuff that I think is a little bit overboard. Um, and the market's not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to get the rents that you're projecting. You know, if you're coming into one of those markets that has a lower median income and then you're going to put 40000 a door into it and pop rents 500 bucks, probably not going to work out, right? So just take a step back, even though you think that you can do that, right? You know, just think, does this make sense? Because I think at the end of the day, you're going to have a lot of investors, a lot of eyes on it, and they're going to poke holes in it too, right? So you need to be able to anticipate and, and really get ahead of some of those questions that they might have because once again, it is it is the story of what you're gonna do to the property because at the end of the day, you, you can only do so much and the, the, the area in itself, you're not gonna be able to fix up, right? So you've got property financing we talked about, financial projections, which kind of goes hand in hand, right? You've gotta go out and what are the returns, right? The people gotta need to know that. They wanna know what the plan is, they wanna know what the team is, and then ultimately, they, and where, they, where it's located, and then ultimately they wanna know what are my returns on this. Yep. And it needs to be in line with whatever expectations you set for your investors too, right? And some investors' expectations are a lot lower, some are a lot higher, mm-hmm. right? And you need to ultimately be able to position the deal in a way where it's, it's something that they wanna actually take on. So you need to present that. And then the investment process, right? You've kind of gone through the whole shebang of doing a webinar, whether it's live or, or, or it's recorded. We now do ours recorded. But you know, you've gotta, you gotta talk them about the, the process and the timeline, right? You're gonna say, okay, hey, you need to have your paperwork in, ASAP, wire or funds in by you know, whatever date and ultimately kind of help white glove the process a little bit because there's, there might be some investors that have never done this before. They don't know that they have to fill out a PPM and a subscription agreement and all yep. these other things. So talking that, talking through that process and really hand-holding them a little yeah, bit. Yeah, last thing is, you wanna do is get someone excited but not tell them how to, what, what yeah, to do next, you can right? get, they, You like, don't wanna the almost close thing. a deal and miss the easiest part. You know, and so, and so look through, there's a lot of investor portals and, and people starting off because they say, well, that's just another cost, I get it. Right, but they really do, at least Investnext has really kind of streamlined our whole investment process. And so it's something to kind of look into because that, like, like Ferris say, brought up a really good point, right? You don't want to get everybody excited and then like, okay, now what? And then you're not there, you're, you're fumbling around emailing them documents and waiting for them to email back. It's just not a very efficient way of doing it, right? So um, I would say that that's kind of it, man. I mean, you know, just to kind of give you a little bit more insight into our process, right? So we get something under contract, we do the due diligence, we make sure that we're moving forward with the thing, then we're gonna send a teaser email out, right? Now the teaser email is to invite people to the webinar, right? Then we shoot the webinar, and then we ultimately will send out another email with the webinar and all the PPM and all the, the subscription agreement and all the good stuff that they have to fill out along with some, some instructions. We send that out usually typically the following week you know, for, you know, for example, for Cheval, for people that are following us, we're dropping that this Thursday. 
So at the end of the day, you know, from there, that's essentially when it's starting the raise, right? And then it's just a matter of first come, first served, right? But we try to obviously set those right expectations too, that, hey, this is gonna go quick, this is not some sales pitch. You know, typically our deals are funding in one week. So, you know, the person that needs two weeks to do due diligence or they're out of town or whatever, yeah. you know, they might miss out, on, on, unfortunately. It's gonna move quick. Yeah, it's gonna move really quick. How and, much are we raising for this next deal, Ben? 25 million. How fast are we gonna raise it? About a week. You know. I'm guessing come end of day Tuesday, we're done. Yeah, it might even be less so than Thursday a week. to Tuesday. That's my thing. You know, and, and we're not doing this to, to, to humble brag here, folks, right? We're just telling you that we're trying to explain that to our investors, too, because they need to understand that they need to move quickly. Right now, you might have a little bit more time, or you might, you know, allow your investors to have a little bit more time. But just realize that the more time that you give them, you know, the the less likely they might be to take action. Right? Yeah, you always have to have some sense of urgency when you're when you're putting out a deal because you know, let's just be honest. Other people have deals too. Yep. Right? And uh, if they think that, well, if I got, you know, if I got a month to take a look at this, kick the kick the tires on it. You know, and then ultimately some other sexy deal comes along, right? And they said, well, actually, I like this deal better. And they're going to go after that one. So, the, you know, something to think about when you're rolling out a deal. But from there, really, that's it. I mean, there might be, you know, I think there's been one or two, one or two times that we've kind of sent a follow-up email like, hey, there's, you know, 5% left or whatever just to kind of get it across the finish line. But that's essentially our whole entire process, yep. right? So, you, you know, we, we start off from the deck and then from the deck we do the webinar and then it's just a, 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 the legal paperwork and then we shoot that all out to our investors and walk them and handhold them and white glove them through the process. So that's about it, man. Yeah, I so mean, let's see. So Money Mondays is every Monday, 3.30 Central. If you have comments, questions, leave them. I know we've got a few, so I'm gonna go ahead and just go through a few of these. All right. Mark Pantak, how's it going? Long term receipt. This is good stuff, guys. Prime location is premium price. Absolutely. All right, we've done enough deals that location just makes life a lot easier. So certainly does. You know, and again, we'll do both, but it just you, there's a premium mentally for it too. Right? Yeah, and we're fine with that, right? You know, but I mean, at the end of the day, right? It's it's to each their own, right? Some people are going to say, "Hey, I'll, I'll go into a secondary market and do that value add play." And we've done those too. So we just over time we've kind of evolved as a company and and started chasing stuff that are more in primary markets better parts of town because that's where we're seeing the most rent growth. So that's just, you know, our strategy, but people got all kinds of different strategies. Absolutely. Right? So, so let's keep going. So Rasul right. says a lot of people don't take into consideration the income of the neighborhood before not. trying to hike rents to comps that aren't even that close. Had two separate deals that sent to me today that people were asking with way higher assumptions that I thought was feasible in those markets. It's Rasul, an important- you hit it right on the head, my friend. But I, I'll say this though, it's an important point but you also have to understand trends. And so while the market today maybe doesn't support that income, right? If you see the trend and you know things are completely getting redone and you're actually in the path of growth, right? You will be able to support that, right? Maybe not immediately and maybe even immediately because ultimately you have to assume all the data that you look at is just, is aged to some extent, right? Yeah. Most census data, you know, and let's not talk about federal census, but you know, most of the metrics that you see about income, all that is, is one or two years old. Right, a lot changes in a market in one or two years, and so something to keep in mind. Right, where it was one or two years ago may not be today, and so you want to look at the micro submarket. We also want to look at more of kind of the the larger submarket and what's going on. And, and and the best way to do that, you know, I mean, I agree, I agree with you. You know, at the end of the day, that's still a data point that you got to check and you got to make sure that it, it it makes sense, right? But the best way to determine is a market changing for the better, or maybe even for the worse, just to go out there. That's why in property tours, we yeah, we get to go see the apartment. I'll walk around. Okay, it's an apartment, right? You know, maybe you'll have some insight into some things that you might want to do or you'll be able to dial in that CapEx number. But the main reason that we do property tours is really to determine what, what, what does the area look like, right? And hang Where, out with brokers. And hang out with brokers, right? But, you know, ultimately we're looking around. Is there new development happening, right? Or is it a bunch of boarded up retail? Or, you know, is there a bunch of you know, pawn shops and check cashing places, right? You know, I mean, you can start really getting an idea of what type of people are in that market and what ultimately what can it support, right? You know, and so getting out there and, and verifying that data is probably one of the more important things to do, right? So, all right, so we had some questions come in. You know, I'm gonna go through those. How do you determine your upgrade or amenity package? I think really for us, it's, Really, a, a, it's a function of how much deferred maintenance, first and foremost, because some of the stuff that you have to do, you're going to have to bake that in, 
Now, not everything. You're not going to be able to put five, ten million dollars into every single deal, but the more important the, the emergency stuff you're going to have to do, right? So you take that right off the top, and then you ultimately determine what kind of upgrade that you want to do to the amenities and the interiors, and what is the market doing too, right? You know, I mean, if everybody, and I'll give an example, if everybody in the market is doing stainless steel appliances and you have white, and they're getting two hundred dollar premium and you know, maybe it's not necessarily just the stainless steel. You might have to elevate a few other things, but you can start kind of saying, okay, maybe I got to do stainless steel. And if I got to do stainless steel, then it's going to cost me $1,500 to $2,000, depending on where you get them from, uh, per unit, right? There, right off the bat, you're spending two grand a unit just to get that $200 pop, which is still pretty good return on your investment. But then you're also just, a, you know, you're going to have to do some secret shopping and figure out what are the other guys and gals doing in that market to determine really what is that upgrade package going to look like. And that's really when we do not only property tours, but we also, when we're doing our due diligence, right, we're shopping comps, we're determining what are the other competition doing. And then we're ultimately saying, okay, can we back into that? Does that make sense for what we're trying to do as part of our CapEx and business plan? So um, one other question, how do you build your exit strategy? Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you have to determine how long do you want to hold something for. Some of it's going to be determined by the financing that you can get, right? You know, you've got a bridge loan, but maybe you've got an initial term of three and then you've got two one-year extensions, right? You know, can you refinance out of that or sell the property within three to five years? So some of that's going to be driven by your financing options that you have. And I think ultimately it's also driven by your investors' expectations. Mm -hmm. What are they willing to do? We have some guys that we know in the business that their investors are totally cool holding on to it for 10 years. Um, Our investors are not like that. They're a little bit more transactional. They want to do the three to seven. Seven might even be pushing it for some of our And you know, a lot of times, guys, it's it's about not picking one rabbit hole and sticking going down it, right? You got to give yourself flexibility. It's really, it's market driven, right? The market really, I tell that as an investor, the market tells me when to sell the deal, right? And we will take that opportunity once it makes sense. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, right? You can't be rigid, right? You know, that's why it's nice having a couple different options that, you know, hey, if this happens, then we'll do this. But I think our, our, our philosophy is if we can get above that total return number, above that average annualized return by a significant amount within, say, three years versus seven, we're going to go ahead and take that deal, yeah. right? Because it's always nice just to continue to keep money churning for our investors because they love, you know, everybody loves getting that money back and redeploying Absolutely. it. Absolutely. The question, have I ever given a not great idea? Ooh. Don't well, answer that. Let's times. keep going. So, um, Cody Lawlin, how's it going, man? Long time to see. It Cody, looks Cody, like Cody. everybody was out there this weekend. We didn't see him. Uh, it says love invest next. Yeah, we, we like it as well. So so far so good. Yeah, it's been pretty. It's been pretty good in comparison to the last one that we were on. So yeah. um, all right. So what goes into structuring investor returns? You know, yeah. I, I think at the end of the day, right? You have to determine what is that box that I'm going to present to my investors. And you know, you're gonna have to find deals that hit that box, right? If, if your investors are always expecting a 20% IRR, then you're gonna be wading through that for quite some time to find a 20% IRR deal, uh, especially in this market. But if your investors are totally cool with, say, a 12 to 13% IRR, you're, you're definitely gonna be able to find a lot more deals to, to maybe potentially move forward with. So it really de- it depends on that, that box and, and the, the expectations that your investors have as to what your returns are gonna be. And you should have been having these conversations as you've you networked with them, met them, had coffee with them. You're, you're ultimately always soft pitching some kind of hypothetical deal, right? And these are the hypothetical returns. So whenever that deal does hit their inbox and you have that teaser email, they're gonna know, okay, hey, you know, disrupt equity, it's always gonna be, you know, this or that, right? And they're gonna ultimately automatically know that ahead of time. So tips for sharing, highlighting your business plan with your investors. You know, I mean, I think once again, I kind of went through our process, right? It's it's a combination of email blasts, you know, investor decks and webinars. And yeah, it's kind of a proven you know, method. There's a lot of people that we know in the business that do the exact same. Some people don't do webinars at all. You know, the open door guys, they, they do it for our benefit because <laughs> we want them to, but they don't do webinars, right? Everything is through the Investnext portal and it's, it's a pretty streamlined, simplified uh, process for them. But you know, we're, we're kind of detail oriented guys and we like to kind of really dig into the weeds and I think our investors expect that from us. So we love putting the deck together, or Shanna loves putting the deck together. All right, right let's keep going. She's laughing. So She's a like, few eh, more, I don't know about that. A few more comments, questions, right? Trevor says, as always, great info. You're welcome. 
Cody asked, how are you factoring in the current inflationary environment to your business plan? So that's a good question, right? It's hard to factor in, right? I mean, yes, it might lead to, you know, things getting more expensive, yeah. it might lead to things getting less expensive. The way I ultimately see it is kind of a wash right now is we are seeing real rent growth that we haven't seen, right? And everybody yeah. models two and a half, three percent rent growth on most of these deals, right? And you know, we've seen double, triple that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. 10, and 15, so, 20 percent in some cases. And so ultimately, as rates go up, right, your NOI is going up, right? Which means, you know, the value of the property is going up. Now, with inflation, you're probably going to see cap rates go up, which means the value of the property is actually going to go down, but I think it's just going to get offset with the increase in NOI. So I, I kind of see it being a wash. Ultimately, I'm not betting one way or the other. I just kind of go into these deals well capitalized, you know, just in case there is yeah. a big pullback. But I mean, again, you, this should not slow you down from doing your business plan. And ultimately on your exit, right, all of this only matters on the exit. Yeah. And so think through what does that mean on the exit? You know, does your cap rate make sense, right? I see some guys that'll buy, that'll overpay on a deal, buy for two cap and say, I'm doing a two and a half cap on the exit. That's conservative. Yeah, but if it's a three cap market or a four cap market, you know, that doesn't make sense. So really think that holistically outside of the deal. Yeah, and, and, and I'd add to that. I mean, I do agree that it'll probably in, in the end wash Right, you know, but you're gonna have to realize that things are going up on the expense side too, right? So payroll, um, appliances are probably two things. We always know, at least here in Texas, the taxes and insurance ain't going anywhere other than up. So you gotta take that into consideration. Yeah, we're seeing rent growth, and I think that's what's really fueling a lot of this, this fire uh, in the market. But you've also gotta realize that all this stuff's kinda getting to a new normal, right? You're not gonna see 10, 20% rent growth year over year. But your appliances are at two grand now when, when they used to be 1500 maybe 12 months ago or 24 months ago. That two grand probably ain't going back down. So you're going to have to bake that new thing in and probably at some point, you know, adjust those, that rent growth projections back to something that's more normalized. So in the end, what does that do to cap rates? Nobody knows. Nobody has a crystal ball. In fact, I don't think anybody was expecting 2021 to turn into the year that it had. I think we went in January and just kind of, you know, kind of getting after the holidays and then boom, it was like getting shot out of a cannon in terms of just people were, were hot for multifamily. And it really started driving asset prices very, very quickly and a lot higher than we would have ever expected. And, and especially in places like Atlanta, I mean, it's, it's gone up 30, 40% this year. So something to take into consideration. Absolutely. So we got any other questions? So let's see, so we do have a few more. So Amanda asks, are you seeing any trends on the expense side? Yeah. Supply chain disruptions of materials, labor shortages or increased cost of labor? Yes, we are. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's what I was just Turn costs are going up, yeah, labor's gone another, up, oh. supplies have gone up, appliances have gone up $500 just alone, right? Yeah. So things have gone up, you kind of have to model that and just, that's where contingencies actually help resolve some of these issues, so. Yeah, no, I mean, assume like uh, you, everybody's seen at the grocery store, at the gas station or whatever, like multifamily's not insulated from any of those things, right? Especially, I would say that the two biggest things that I'm seeing, other than, you know, and we always, you know, say it begrudgingly, the tax and the insurance, is the appliances, and uh, which is, there is some supply chain disruptions on that, so just be aware of that, and then payroll as well. I think you're gonna have to start- Flooring. Yeah, flooring as well. Yeah, I think those three things, which are major expenses at a property level, um, have all gone up. But once again, at least for right now, the next 12 to 18 months, you know, there's going to be a fair amount of rent growth too. That help is, I think, hopefully going to help offset some of that additional expense. So just take that into consideration, right? And then it's all ultimately going to be market driven. Some markets might be easier to get some of the stuff, or might not be as expensive. Also depends on your purchasing power as well. So. All right, man. What else we got? That's it? No that's other questions? It. I caught you off guard? No, so no there's no more. No, no, I mean, I was paying attention. I'm saying there's just no more, so. Uh, he's yeah. really just scrolling on Facebook here, folks. Oh, yeah. of course. No, I, never, I never get any work done around here, so. Well, it wouldn't be a Money Monday if we weren't talking about Our conference. What? Well, we've got two conferences coming up, right? We have oh. Multifamily Con coming up in Orlando in a month. Nope. Oh, right? Oh. Where, what's the URL on that? Multifamilycon.com. Boom. Right, it's check that out. Check that so out. So definitely check that out. Use the code MFM for big discount, right? So we'll be there. We'll be networking, hanging out with everybody. Yep. Two-day conference, really, you know, jam-packed in terms of two days, two days of sessions, lots of content, lots there of speakers. There is a lot of speakers. So come so, come ready to network, come ready to learn some stuff. We're really excited about that one. And coming up in February, what do we have, Ben? We have oh our biggest conference ever. 
Multifamily Investor Network Conference. We are very, very excited about it here in Houston, February 12th, 2022. We're giving you plenty of time to plan. We're not dropping this on you folks. This is still four months out. But if you want to get a great savings, once again, I said this last week, I don't think we're making any money with this discount code. So you better go ahead and and use it before I tell Shannon to take it down. OCT150 at checkout and get yourself $150 off those executive tickets. I think VIP might be sold out or maybe there's like one or two left, you know, but those are for the executive tickets, which, you know, is a great value for what you get in a one day conference, right? So check it out, mfinvestornetwork.com. Pop in OCT150 in the discount uh, or for the coupon code at checkout. And we'll see you February 12th, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, All right. So what are we said, talking about we'll next week? Wrap. So next week we're talking about strategies to identify value and opportunities in multifamily real estate. Value add opportunities, value add. man. Sorry, Come on. Where's your coffee at? <laughs> no, no. no. I actually threw that away. Long story. <laughs>